Well, good morning and welcome. Happy Friday, everyone, to the July 21st, 2023 Middle Mile Advisory Committee meeting. The first uh, order is to call roll. So, Ms. Alvarado, would you please call roll? Yes. First, I will go over housekeeping rules. Attendees, please note there is time allocated at the end of the meeting for public comments, either in person, Zoom, phone, or email. <laughs> Presenters, please cue Sam to advance your slides. Committee members, please raise your hands to speak and ex officio, please use your raise hand feature in Zoom to cue Director Bailey Crimmins to call on you to speak. Now, committee member roll call. State CIO and Director Bailey Crimmins. Here. President Reynolds. Here. Chief Deputy Director Miller. Teresa Calvert for Ms. Chief. Calvert. Here. Pardon me. Director Tavares. Deputy Keeper for Director Tavares. Here. Secretary Payne. Here. Here. Senator McGuire. Here. Senator, Senator Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Assembly Member Burner. Assembly Member Wood. Supervisor Alejo. I'm here uh, zooming in from Austin, Texas. Thank you. Supervisor Starkey. I am here on Zoom. Director Bailey Crimmins, we have a quorum. Thank you. I also like to personally thank the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration for allowing us to utilize their boardroom. We have a great team here today to support us and we can't do it without you. So thank you very much. Uh, today, we're going to hear project updates um, from CDT, Caltrans, Golden State Net, and CPUC. Are there any committee members that would like to provide any brief comments um, before we get started? I will first look to my colleagues um, on the dais if you have any comments before we get started, and then we'll go to the members um, that are uh, connecting remotely. So any questions? All right, I see none on the dais. Uh, do we have any um, members that want to make any comments remotely? Nick, any? I did. Okay, fantastic. All right, we'll go ahead and get started with the executive report, which is Mr. Mark Monroe. Good morning, uh, Chair and members. Uh, uh, Mark Monroe, the Deputy Director for the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative, and uh, we're excited to be able to uh, um, come to our third uh, quarterly meeting of the year and to be able to provide an update on the project. Um, as I think everybody you know knows, certainly this this project is a priority for the administration and really an, an early effort in in, in a broader uh, infrastructure um, uh, efforts to that we're going to really help a lot of Californians and so um, it's it's very it's a high priority and uh, we're we're glad to be a part of it and to be able to provide an update on it. Um, I think as we can kind of go to the next slide here, I think we'll um, as everybody um, hopefully is aware. Uh, we're, we've been we've moved into the execution phase for this project in terms of going. You know, we, we spent a lot of time really trying to go through and plan a lot, of, do a lot of planning efforts in the um, the first year, um, and so um, we're really really moving into the or we're really into the execution phase at this point. Our primary focus has been um, optimization and uh, trying to take a look at um, the, all of the state's needs and weigh them against the funding available. And we'll be providing some updates on that this morning. Um, uh, since we last met, uh, the, um, some, some might be aware that we uh, that, that CDT received uh, a $73 million uh, federal grant from the NTIA uh, that is uh, included in is one of our funding sources now. Uh, that's uh, we uh, received word of that about a, a month ago, and uh, very excited about that. And similarly, we're uh, you know we want everybody to know we are we've actually started to receive uh, the critical materials that we had, had gone out and ordered, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. But we've actually started to to uh, re receive uh, fiber and conduit in anticipation of moving towards construction. Uh, this morning, um, uh, we will be CDT. We will be providing an update on the. Uh, 
on our optimization efforts and uh, how we are, we're, we're planning to implement the project going forward. Uh, Caltrans will be providing an update on its uh, pre-construction efforts as it moves towards uh, towards actually being able to start construction um, of certain segments. Um, and uh, Golden, Golden State Net, our third party administrator, will be uh, um, reviewing uh, some of the, uh, the the work it's doing regarding engineering, um, some of the, the outreach work that it's done, as well as business development. Um, and then the Public Utilities Commission will be providing an update on uh, its last mile efforts, uh, which are so key to uh, to syncing up with the middle mile uh, to make sure that we have we're able to provide end to end connectivity. With that, that's the end of my uh, executive report out. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. I appreciate you laying out the agenda for today. I also like to acknowledge that um, Assemblymember Wood is in the audience. So thank you very much. Um, oh, he's on Zoom. Okay, sorry, he's on Zoom. <laughs> uh, so we'll acknowledge that uh, he is uh, on from a roll call perspective. Is there any questions uh, regarding the agenda before we get started? Uh, anybody uh, raising a hand virtually, Nick? Okay, the next uh, agenda item is Department of Technology project update, Mr. Moreau. All right, very good. So um, we're going to be, I think, uh, you know, certainly the members and the public have been waiting for uh, uh, this, you know, for, for for a number of months to kind of see where all of this optimization work has landed. And so we're going to be talking through that. Um, to uh, To start, though, I wanted to just review real quickly where we started. Uh, two years ago, uh, you know, when this when SB 156 was passed and the initial uh, ARPA funding was provided, uh, preliminary estimates were in the 8,000, 8,100 mile range in terms of what that network would need to look like. Um, some of the, uh, the the estimates that that we had worked on with Caltrans at the time, based on uh, on past projects that it had had, uh, you know, they were they were limited. Caltrans builds roads for the most part, but they had actually done some some fiber work in the past, and so we had estimates uh, in the range of four hundred and fifty five thousand dollars per mile. Um, and so, based on those funding levels, kind of that that initial anticipated scope of the project um, and the the funding available. Uh, there was uh, initially anticipated that the network would be composed primarily or 75% um, of, of construction and 25% um, of uh, these indefeasible rights of use or, or leases. Um, I'm just going to reference them as leases um, in, the, in this presentation. But um, that was broadly how we envisioned putting together uh, and, and developing the, the statewide network. Um, go to, we can go to the next slide. Uh, we've made it a number. Of, we've, we've done a, a lot to really explore all the alternatives in the time since, um, and uh, uh, and so we have updated uh, information, updated assumptions that are really feeding our analysis at this point. Um, so uh, some may remember that uh, we uh, worked with the Public Utilities Commission. They went through um, a robust public process and analysis, um, and then worked with we worked with the, with Golden State Net, our third party administrator, to develop what. Um, would be the the ideal map in terms of uh, a minimal network that that reached all of the um, unserved communities throughout the state and really provide provided the uh, an ideal level of resiliency, and so um, that that we came out uh, last uh, last May with a, a, a ten thousand mile map that we've all been kind of looking at. It's been posted on our website since then that we've been talking through. Um, at the same time, uh, we went out to bid. Uh, for construction for up to half the network in terms of the, the quantity of miles. Um, we've, uh, as the bids have come back, they've been 40% uh, uh, higher than I think we were anticipating, understanding that uh, A, there's, you know, we've had some robust inflation in the time since, but also understanding that um, the, the federal opera funds that we're using um, and all of the other funding that's being ma made available throughout the uh, uh, the country um, means that there there is an increased uh, demand for labor uh, and expertise, and so I think we're, we're that's our understanding of really why why a lot of the costs are coming in higher than anticipated. And then what's what I really want to draw our attention to, um, and we, we've talked about this in the past as well, is um, our implementation approach. So in addition to going out for construction bids, uh, we also went out for uh, using an it's called an RFI squared process. Uh, where we went out to industry and really looked for any and all alternatives. And this could include leases. It could include leases of uh, sp uh, specific components of infrastructure, as well as uh, joint build. We really try to cast as wide a net as possible. As possible. And um, 
and so th that's a, another enormous effort that we that we uh, have gone to, and we've learned that there's a lot more opportunities available there than I think we were expecting, and at a at a better cost, uh, more cost effective uh, rate than we were expecting overall. So, um, these are some of the the, the important uh, updated assumptions uh, that we have going into and and finalizing our optimization process. I'm going to jump to the next slide. So in terms of uh, what we're, we're going to be talking about here is a phased approach. Uh, we have, um, you know, we went through and looked segment by segment of the full 10,000 mile map. We um, looked at uh, where, again, where all of the uh, unserved communities were um, and, uh, and really the distance to um, the, the network. I think that's uh, also a key element. Also going through looking at the resiliency we had built into the 10,000 mile network. Um, and and then again, trying to make use of all of the most uh, uh, the most cost effective approaches to the project. And so um, this is these are our leases and our joint builds and even some purchase opportunities. And so the, this is this is really the um, a lot of the key information that's fed into uh, the phased approach or we're we're going to be talking about here. Uh, can we move to the next slide? So in terms of our objectives, uh, you know, we, we talk about the uh, uh, maximum coverage um, and uh, of unserved households. Um, we, in terms of the, uh, the overall map, we've, we looked at five miles from the network. We looked at 10 miles from the network, just try, trying to find, uh, make sure that as we selected, uh, as, as we decided where and, and when and how to, to go about the project, we were maximizing that, uh, that coverage. Uh, we also, um, and I think this has come up in, in you know, several uh, several conversations since we last met, um, in terms of meeting the the state's labor objectives. Any, regardless of the the way that we develop this, regardless of whether uh, Caltrans is building it, a partner is building it, or um, you know, even if we're uh, going to be leasing infrastructure that is uh, that is going to be installed uh, specifically for the state. Um, under all those circumstances, uh, the state pays. Um, uh, uh, prevailing wage, and so um, we want to make sure that that's uh, that, that that everybody understands that um, we are meeting that uh, meeting that commitment. Um, similarly, um, we are uh, looking at to maximize the linkage. Uh, you know, we talk about providing middle mile that that really you need that last mile linkage, and so um, we uh, we want to uh, make sure that as the Public Utilities Commission, for example, goes out with. Uh, um, a, their, their federal funding account uh, um, grant application process, which is currently open, um, that uh, applicants have the uh, uh, an up-to-date map to understand where they would need to connect to and where those opportunities are. And we work on a, a, a weekly basis with the Public Utilities Commission to, to kind of update our shared information there. And then the, the last objective here is to really maximize all the funding uh, available. And so at this point, um, there was a $3.25 billion that was provided by ARPA. There was um, another $550 million that is being provided in general fund. And then, as noted, we have uh, in the last month received uh, approval for a $73 million grant from the NTIA, bringing our total to the $3.87 billion. Shall we move to the next slide? So what we see here is um, phase one. We talk about a phased approach. Um, uh, the the, fo the focus here is phase one. This here is a map um, of uh, 8,300 miles approximately. Uh, this is what we believe with the current funding level uh, that, that we can afford to develop. Uh, this would be developed within the, the federal ARPA timeframes. Um, we have to have all of those funds under, under contract by the end of 2024 uh, with the funds uh, uh, liquidated and with uh, an operational network by the end of 2026. And so um, given the funding level um, and uh, given all of the, the analysis that we've done, this is where th these are the, the, the 8,300 mile map that we have landed on. Uh, there's been some discussion um, in uh, certainly at the last MMAC as well as others where um, looking at kind of how we're delivering it. And so uh, I think uh, a key point we wanted to to, uh, to focus on here is that when we look at th this map here, I hope folks can see it, it is um, uh, about two thirds um, blue. Uh, what that means is the blue uh, represents um, 
alternative methods of developing of delivering the network, alternatives to, to just standalone construction. And so um, that would be uh, leases, that would be um, joint builds. And so what we see up here is that um, the overall architecture is we will um, uh, be leasing uh, approximately 4,500 miles um, is what we would expect. We're still in negotiations uh, trying to finalize some of these deals. So we, we're, we're limited in how much we can share in terms of more specific details, but we did want the members and the public to understand you know, the various uh, ways that we're considering and really if they can look at a map and be able to see um, how their segments are, are, are going to be delivered. So um, in, in terms of that, we uh, this also reflects 1,800 miles of Caltrans uh, standalone construction um, that, uh, that we'll be moving forward with. Those are the, the orange sections uh, or the, um, yeah, and then and this, uh, the blue also includes 500 miles of purchases. So, and again, we note that um, the $73 million in NTIA, grant, NTIA grants is, is put it as uh, included in here. And this is, this is um, we, can, we can go ahead and go to the next slide here. Um, but one of the, the key things, and, and, and this looks a lot like it did last time in terms of when we look at the overall 10,000, we just, we just looked at the 8,300 mile map. When we look at the overall 10,000 mile map, um, this is still the architecture we would expect, and we can see, I think Caltrans is hard to read there, but I think it's about 35% um, that would, would still need to be constructed uh, between phase one and phase two. Um, but um, we can see here, and I think this, this really illustrates that uh, um, by, by sharing the cost of development, sharing the cost of construction um, and with industry, we've really been able to make the funding go uh, significantly further than it otherwise would and, and was uh, was really envisioned two years ago. So I think, uh, you know, the team has uh, done a lot of really good work to to look at every alternative to make this to, to make phase one as uh, as expansive as possible and to reach as many of the unserved communities. Uh, as, again, um, Regardless of where this is, we're pursuing um, 288 count fiber and the same frequency of access points. Um, this is going to really uh, limit our vulnerability to in terms of having to build at high cost areas. Um, and in the end, the state will uh, own and uh, and manage the network. We can go to the next slide here. Now, in terms of phase two, um, we uh, we're looking for alternatives to how we can um, develop that as well. Um, one of the key components we'll be looking at as we move to construction is um, exploring design alternatives, um, reduced number of conduit perhaps, or um, depth. There's, there's, a, there's a number of design decisions that we want to explore with the construction contractors um, to see if we can save some, um, save some money there in construction. Any savings uh, would, be, would then go to phase two. And so, um, and, and we would be doing that on an incremental basis. So um, that was something we'd be com coming back and reporting to the member or to the MMAC on. Um, similarly, we talk about, uh, the, you know, the, the sync up with last mile funding. Um, so as the, the PUC um, is going forward with, uh, with funding last mile projects, um, there can be essential middle mile components um, that might be included in that. And so um, to the extent that those are um, some segments are necessary, you know, in, in phase two, uh, to really provide that connectivity for those last mile uh, members or for the, la the, the last mile communities, um, uh, that's, that's another alternative uh, perhaps for, for closing the gap in some areas. Um, and then there's always the the the, the obvious solution of, of of continuing to look for other uh, uh, federal funds. We know that federal funds, as well as um, uh, other sources, where uh, as um, as broadband funding really becomes um, uh, continues to become available uh, nationwide. Uh, next slide. This here is the the, the timeline. Um, I apologize. The uh, a lot of what's been done is kind of grayed out to the point where it's not terribly visible here. But uh, the, the really the, the key three points I want to point to are um, the quarter one through three here, the optimization phase one development that we're, we're presenting here. That was um, that's been um, uh, the the major focus of of trying to get to where we're at today with the phase with the phased approach. Uh, we can see uh, that we're expecting cal uh, construction to begin um, in the in the months to come here. Um, and Caltrans will be talking a little more about that. Um, and then um, another key point I want to note is that uh, when we look at completing the project, we look at the ARPA deadline by the end of 2026, 
Um, you can note there that the lease segments we expect to be on online and be able to start providing connectivity um, in mid-2025. So overall, uh, when it comes to the ARPA deadlines, we uh, were about 18 months ahead of schedule. Um, and similarly, when it comes to the, the leases and when we're going to be able to provide some connectivity uh, through, um, through the leases, um, that also is, uh, again, 18 months ahead of uh, where uh, a lot of the other construction um, will, will, will likely be able to come online. Next slide. All right, and the last thing I want to point out here, uh, real quick, here is I men mentioned earlier we uh, we started to receive. We've now received um, uh, over a thousand miles of fiber, um, as well as a th um, over a thousand miles of conduit. So um, one of the one of the early steps we took last year was to go out for procurement for materials that we knew would be hard to get. Uh, materials we knew that there uh, would potentially be constraints as the rest of the country uh, ramped up. Um, and really worldwide. And so we knew we wanted to get, get in the front of the line, if you will. And so uh, to that point, we went out um, and, uh, and pro, um, procured uh, um, uh, several thousand miles of material, and that has begun to be delivered. You can see here, we've been able to come to a, or visit a, a, a local site where it's being stored. Um, so just uh, excited to, to share with you some really ma some material um, progress in the project. With that, I will... Uh, that, that, that's the end of my update. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. I'd also like to acknowledge Assemblymember Berner uh, has joined, and so thank you very much. And uh, we would uh, like to uh, open it up to uh, the members here in the room if there's any questions, and then I'll then open it up to uh, members that are online. Any questions for here in the room? Yes. I, I do have a uh, question, and um, two things. One is... Um, um, thank you for that gray bar. Uh, I think it was fun at the vendor with all the supply. It was great to see it just kind of massive volume of uh, lines and conduit. And it, you, I mean, we're talking about that what's only a portion of what the state of California going to have on this middle mile, but just that is just overwhelming. So really um, appreciate the work that the team is uh, doing. And your leadership, Mark and uh, or Mr. Monroe and the and the director for continue to move the ball uh, forward. Uh, my question is specifically on. Um, I think there was an earlier slide. Um, I think a slide ten that talks about that. Regardless whether it was a lease, a built by Caltrans, a joint built, or possibly even the purchase, which that's a, a it's a five hundred mile only. The designed requirement for all of that is 288 um, the strand yes. of fibers. Yeah, yes. Now, thank you for that question. Um, what I'll what I'll say is yes. That that's been our that's been our intent um, as we as we approach all of the partnerships in terms of the design is being able to have that. Um, I, I'm not. Uh, I can't say for certain that every single mile will that will be available, and that that's the only limitation is what. Um, what what materially is available, um, but but yes, that is um, that has been our approach to all of this, and I think it's something that uh, we're uh, virtually all of the network will have that same uh, same fiber count and the same uh, um, same frequency of access. Okay, that's good. Um, and then also the the fact that um, again, regardless, it, it either whether it's a lease or build or join build or abide, I also saw the bullet that California will be owning and managing the network. So yes. from that aspect, it's really, you know, it's less relevant how those network miles would be obtained, but the ownership, the, the ability to maintain it, as well as the requirement having, you know, ADA fiber count, it's a, a standard requirement for all of these. Yes, that is okay. correct. And so Great. CDT will have full, full ownership to make sure that, um, that the public is getting the, the highest quality service. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, and I, I wanted to first uh, have my colleagues go first. I, I wanted to ask a question. When will the map be available? I know folks are taking pictures of it and it's fairly small on the screen. Can you, um, Mr. Rowe, let folks know when that will be available on the website? Um, um, I, I'm, my, my first answer will be as soon as possible. Um, I think our team is already working on um, being able to add this as a layer to our public website map. Um, and so um, I would say... I expect it within a month, um, and I'm hoping within a, a week or two. Uh, I, it's 
um, I can get back to you with, with some more specifics on that, but I know that the team has already been working on, um, on being able to update that and in, in our system. So it's, we want to make sure everybody can have access to it as soon as possible. Uh, the other thing I'll, I will also note is that um, uh, by next week, uh, by early next week, we normally will have the slides uh, from the Mental Model Advisory Committee uh, posted on our website. So the map that was perhaps difficult to see here this morning um, will be there and, and much, much more visible. Thank you, Mr. Morrell. All right, uh, President Reynolds. Thanks. Uh, no questions, but I did just want to thank uh, Mr. Monroe for the presentation and commend you for all the work. I know this is a huge project, and in particular in uh, securing the NTIA grant, the additional funding. Um, the 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 dollars that we're looking here are huge, and and every bit counts. And so, I I wanted to note that that's great to get that additional funding. So thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, I'd go ahead and open it up to the members um, online. Can you, I, I can't see the screen, so I apologize. So if maybe, um, Alicia, if you could call on the members for me. Yes, yes. Uh, Assembly yes. Member Wood. Yes, thank you. Uh, Assembly Member Wood, where um, I, I know you don't mean to sound like a robot, but for some, for some reason the cell phone doesn't seem to be working. Um, can we try again? I know we can't hear you, but maybe we um, can do a call in uh, versus uh, so. Maybe uh, we, do we have, yes, yeah, so we, we, we'll go ahead and try to figure out a way to do a call in. In the meantime, uh, is there another member that might have a question while we get the technical difficulties resolved for Assembly Member Wood? Assembly Member Berner. Yes, I wanna thank you and I'm, I'm sorry that I joined a little bit late. So if you covered this already um, or if it's later on the agenda, um, please feel free to table this question. Um, I really appreciate the timeline, appreciate the detail. You know, one of my biggest concerns is how the middle mile uh, will work with the end mile. And you had mentioned in your presentation that they could cover it. How is that going to logistically work? That's the first question. And the second question is, because we have a public asset and we should use it for a public benefit, how are we ensuring that those who are tapping into the middle mile, um, who are providing um, a low cost option for our unserved and underserved communities, are getting priority in that process. Sure. So, uh, first of all, the, the question on the um, uh, on the, the the mechanics of being able to connect. Um, the way I've described it in the past is that uh, you know not not all communities, not all unserved communities, are on a state highway. And so there has been, there's always been an understanding that there would be other other what we'll call middle mile needs to get back to the state network. Um, the this and so I think we've uh, the, the the public utilities commission um, calls that the uh, other essential middle mile. So what I'd say is we've always I think that's always been. Uh, accepted as, as perhaps uh, certainly one, one alternative for um, for uh, grant application requests, um, and then. Um, and so the, this, if say uh, a city needed to build seven miles out to the highway system, and now given this, they're going to, you know, need to build another three along along that route to get to where the the phase one ends, then um, then I that, that's that's still something we would then continue to work with. Uh, uh, to, to work with the last mile provider on to make sure that we connect in the same way that we would we would have before. Does that kind of answer your question? It answers the first part of the question. Um, the second okay. part had to do with, um, you know, because our middle mile network is a public benefit, how are we ensuring that we're prioritizing those that are serving disadvantaged, unserved, underserved communities at a lower cost? And an affordable rate has priority in and in tapping into that. So, um, you know, a couple of elements. I think as we're still um, developing the um, uh, kind of the, the business aspect of it, um, or uh, I think we envision a certain um, the SB one fifty six says that the network has to be a for, uh, 
uh, affordable and has to be uh, offered at or below market rate. So I think um, that that's our first guideline um, as we're as we're moving forward. Um, okay. What I'll say too is that when it comes to capacity. Um, our, our network is going to be able to, uh, with 288 count fiber, um, we, we should not be bumping up against any limitations uh, right away. When we talk about um, uh, certainly lit service, uh, we'll be able to handle that um, very easily. Um, when we talk about dark fiber services, um, those uh, we anticipate looking at those and and um, and uh, and breaking and kind of limiting and capping the amount that any one carrier would have access to, uh, so that we are able to keep it competitive um, and and make sure that there's plenty of access. Uh, so I think we, we've looked at it as uh, you know maybe five or ten percent of the fibers. So just to make sure that um, that it continues to provide a maximum accessibility to uh, to unserved communities. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Berner, for the excellent question. Uh, we are going to go ahead and go back to Assemblymember Wood. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, I don't know why my why the other isn't working, but anyway, thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to uh, Mr. Monroe for the maps and and all of the work. Um, um, I'm, I am curious, um, you know, phase two, um, and not we don't really know when that's going to um, roll out or or uh, and and how that parts of that are going to be prioritized. Uh, unless I, I, I'd love to hear you comment on that a little bit. And I, and I guess I'll go back to you because I've got a specific area of concern in my district um, in the West County of Sonoma County where there's a pocket of probably about 10,000 people out there um, on the way out. And there's about, um, and that's now phase two. And this is, as we look at underserved communities, this is part of probably one of the poorest areas of my of my district in the in this county anyway so um so i'm just curious as to you know as you move into phase two how how are you prioritizing that um this is an area that's also prone to flooding prone to fires so um the ability to access uh, information and services um, is already challenging um, so I was just, you know, yeah, I'll say, I'll just say it right now, I'm disappointed to see that that's now a phase two project, but so I am curious as to how, how you're going to begin prioritizing, uh, some of the phase two projects. Um, yeah, I don't thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously if, if, uh, if funding were available, we would, uh, we, we really aspire to the full 10,000 miles. Um, what I'll say is that as we uh, part of our analysis was to look at um, which communities and, and try to get as as much of the um, the network to within five miles of unserved communities as possible. And so um, when we look at that, I think we're um, I want to say we're in the 70 to 80 percent range in terms of within within five miles. So um, the uh, so so some of those uh, certainly I think will the last mile funding can be used to be able to tie back to where the middle mile is. Um, but also uh, with regards to how we'll use any savings and any future funding, I think one of our priorities is for um, for any miles that are further away than, than, than 10 miles. Um, I think that's been a key focus um, looking forward into phase two. Uh, we haven't developed a robust process yet for how we're going to, to implement that, but um, but I think that that's the other side is that um, for uh, for a lot of the state, uh, I, I think uh, eighty percent is within um, within ten miles, uh, and and so um, we're looking at focusing um, any funding, uh, at least uh, you know high priority, and, and focusing new funding or focusing any savings on some of those communities that are further than ten miles away. Okay, well, my my staff actually corrected me. That's actually about twenty thousand people that are live along or close to a state highway that that is on the original maps and so we're just uh i think there's going to be about twenty thousand people that are probably going to be disappointed uh, as there's as, as i recognize there'll be a lot of people that are disappointed that that we're gonna that we're that we are find ourselves in the situation that's going to be a second phase i understand i'm not you know i understand why we are where we are so um but these are poor folks that uh been waiting for a long long time so um hopefully we can uh underserved in many, many, many ways, and now and now also 
feeling pretty underserved here as well. So anyway, thank you uh, for that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Assembly Member Wood. Um, any additional questions before we go to the next agenda item? We have a comment from Supervisor Alejo. Okay, Supervisor Alejo. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I'm here at the National Association of Counties Conference. Um, so my question um, in, in, relate, in relation to that is for Mark is, um, what, what's the plan to kind of um, uh, roll out this new additional information with the map? I think it's important to keep the public um, informed and educated and as well as the press, um, local government associations. Um, so maybe if you could just speak to, now that we have this map and it's gonna be posted on the website in a couple of weeks, um, maybe what, what the plan is to maybe um, send that out to the press and so that the public could just, and the public could be able to be more aware of, of the map and it's a good visual, um, but I think you would, it would, um, I think that it's a, an important, phase of the project to to uh, be a little intentional and try to make sure that we're letting the public know that this, this additional information is out there now. Uh, sure, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, a, 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 couple, a couple answers. First of all, um, you know, we, we had talked about uh, about the fact that the Public Utilities Commission um, is uh, currently taking accepting grant applications for their federal funding account. Um, and so uh, we, we've we've provided this map to the Public Utilities Commission to be able to um, make that available. Um, so that's going to be made public, um, I I believe today or or very shortly. I, I'll, I'll let the Public Utilities Commission uh, answer that question. But um, but I think it, it's a high priority for all of us that that get out there so that uh, as last mile communities, uh, to your point, um, consider their alternatives and and, under, and and are developing their grant applications. Uh, they'll have uh, the, the clearest understanding of where they need to build back to. Um, in terms of uh, announcing this, uh, and well, one of the things that we do is um, uh, at CDT is to put out um, a, a monthly newsletter that um, provides links and updates um, on um, broadband for all. Uh, that includes um, information relative to the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative, and so uh, we would we would be able to uh, include a link to the map in that and to to help uh, to use that to be able to provide updates to the public. Great, and and what about progress? Just to, um, with um, <laughs> Internet service providers, ISPs, um, and wanting to utilize the middle mile network that we're um, we're making progress on. Is there any updates, or is that in negotiation still? I just wanted to get an update on uh, participation from the ISP, ISPs. Yeah. So um, when we, uh, I don't know if you're able to, to see the map there, but um, as you know. Given the federal funding and the time frames we're talking about, um, we have uh, uh, we work very closely with the Public Utilities Commission to make sure we all understand or that, that there's a, a shared understanding of where the middle mile network will be, uh, so the last mile providers know where to connect. And that's uh, one of the reasons it was a high priority for us early on to be able to get maps out there as soon as possible. Um, and so um, that that's been one one uh, piece of that. As we move forward here, now that we've got um, a clear idea of phase one, um, we're continuing to reach out. Um, one of the things that uh, that my colleague here, uh, Scott Adams, uh, will be reporting on a bit later is are, are the workshops that we've had over the last um, uh, of the last few months um, and a lot of a lot of engagement um, around the state. And it um, and and a key component of that has been um, sh uh, getting information from. Uh, communities um, from from uh, uh, municipalities from jurisdictions from providers anybody and everybody to be able to present to them the middle mile and to be able to make those connections and so uh, we're, we're proactively trying to uh, gather that information uh, gather their information and reach out and 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 start uh, being able to to tell them give them the specifics about the network and talk about timing and the mechanics of connectivity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President okay. Reynolds. Yeah, thank you. And um, I was wondering if we could take a moment to have Deputy Director Maria Ellis comment on the timing um, of the posting of the maps since that was raised in the last question. Excellent okay. suggestion, thank you. Great. Maria Ellis. Thank you, President Reynolds. 
um, and committee members. Yes, we are certainly, uh, with the map being released today, we are working with CDT to, to ensure that we're going to get that up as in a timely manner as possible. We will be working, um, when I give my update, uh, we'll be happy to work with any applicants um, that uh, uh, have questions about this into the future, but we'll probably be um, more in the 10, 10, 10 days to two week timeline. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate that from CPUC. Are there any additional questions? Uh, yes, we have uh, Supervisor Starkey's hand raised. Oh, great, Supervisor Starkey. Thank you. And, and I wanna echo that the hard work that has been put into this is appreciated. Um, I, I just want to point out that phase two is, is, I'm hoping that it will be on our radar as something that can quickly um, be addressed because just in my county alone, 39 miles are being built but there's still 42 miles and a major chunk of our highway system that, that isn't going to be uh, served in phase one. So I would like to point out that um, I, I echo everything assembly member Wood said, as far as I understand it, I can appreciate it, but I'm really hoping that phase two is, is on the horizon and that we start anticipating how we can accomplish that. Thank you, Supervisor Starkey. Any additional questions? All right, we'll go ahead and go to the next agenda. Actually, if I could, um, Chair, just just one more comment. I, you know, great question, and and really, I think these are, uh, you know, Mr. Monroe and, and folks are just, you know, this is reflecting while there's good progress in Phase One, the people that are not in Phase One is still going to feel left behind, right? And I think we just acknowledge the fact, and and that's why it is really good to. Uh, hear the reiter reiteration that the aspiration and the commitment is continued to work towards the full 10,000 mile because that is what the needs are, right? It, it, despite whether the funding is available or not. Uh, one thing I want to clarify, Mr. Monroe, is the fact that um, <clears throat> when the funding becomes available, available for phase two, uh, it's not if, when, because it's either from the savings of the construction that Caltrans and others are going to continue to work on, either it's from continued funding that, uh, you know, at the federal level, which we're going to continue to demonstrate progress in order to earn more investment to the state of California, as well as the collaboration with um, other funding that the CPUC had to look at what is called essential middle mile, not to not to uh, further take away the last mile because last mile has its dedicated purpose, but the, middle, the essential middle mile potentially is a possibility. When all those combinations come together to fund phase two, the prioritization, I want to make it crystal clear if, if you can validate that, that is going to be prioritized those households that are unserved affected by the uh, phase two, as opposed to in phase two, there's combination of unserved as well as there's some res resiliency, you know, kind of a design. So can you affirmatively say that the phase two um, prioritization will be on the unserved households? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Secretary Tone. All right, next agenda item is from Caltrans update, uh, Janice. Bill member Wood has his hand up. Oh, sorry. As, uh, <laughs> sorry, Assembly Member Wood. No, sorry. and I apologize. I apologize. I apologize for the uh, second question. I, I don't like to do that. But I just a question uh, once again for Mr. Monroe. Um, do we have any uh, sense or idea of, you know, with the 8,300 miles in phase one, um, how many how many potential households are affected? What how, what percentage of uh, people are we still leaving behind uh, temporarily um, while we get to phase two? In other words, how how much of our goal are we reaching in the 8,300 miles versus the people that are you know, what's left out in the in the in, in the second phase? Do you under and if you don't have that, I know that's probably difficult to um, put together. But I think it would be helpful for you know is this is this proportional uh, um, I, I, you know, or you know, um, are we, or is the phase one, you know, getting our biggest bang for our buck? Um, and, and so I just, I kind of want to know what this means in the big picture is that, how, you know, what is it, what is the completion of phase one potentially do for us? Um, and, and, in reducing the number of people who are, uh, no longer, uh, able to access the middle mile. 
Sure, sure. Um, now, this is something that um, we are uh, very focused on. Um, and what I'll say is when we uh, look in terms of the 8,300 miles, uh, um, we estimate that it gets to almost 85% of the state's um, uh, unserved households. And so um, it's it's really uh, has been more focused on getting to those households um, and and it's uh, and, and making sure that as as few communities as possible um, or that as many ser- uh, communities as possible are served. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rowe. Can you cite how what that eighty five percent tile means? Um, what what how number of households? I know you've calculated that number. Can you put it on the record? Sure. Um, so when uh, when a lot of this was being uh, developed a couple of years ago, um, I, I believe the we were tracking a total of about six hundred and seventy five thousand households um, throughout the state uh, that were um, broken into a number of communities um, that were um, unserved, and so that's been a key focus of uh, of, uh, of the program is trying to get to all of the the communities that those households are located in. And so when we talk about 85%, we're, um, I, I think there's uh, um, about 100,000 100, of those households, uh, maybe a little more, that that fall into uh, the phase two. Um, and then the remainder, um, we've got over 570,000 households that uh, are being covered by phase, by phase one. Thank you for the clarification. All right, any other questions? I wanna make sure I don't miss anybody. Uh, is anybody online? Okay. All right. Second agenda item is from Caltrans Update, Ms. Janice Benton. All right. Thank you. Uh, and good morning, Chair Bailey Crimmins, committee members, and members from the public. Um, my name is Janice Benton. I'm the Assistant Deputy Director over the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative for Caltrans, and we'll be providing the update on the progress being made for the Caltrans portion of the Middle Mile uh, Network. So next slide. So with the development of the phased approach that Mr. Monroe just presented, Caltrans is expected to construct approximately 35% of the middle mile network with an emphasis on the 1800 miles in phase one. For this chart, as shared at the April MMAC meeting, we reported on our delivery progress for the full 10,000 mile network and the Caltrans project teams are now updating their project limits and work plans to focus on the phase one Caltrans construction locations So we will provide an update on this information at the next MMAC meeting representing those projects. I would like to note that the work performed by Caltrans to date on miles that will now be delivered through alternative delivery methods will be shared with CDT to support their delivery of the network. Next slide. So as as we've been focused on, Caltrans remains steadfast in getting the work underway and in the hands of the contractors and shovels in the ground. We are maintaining close coordination and partnership with CDT. With the evolution of the phased approach, Caltrans wants to ensure alignment and concurrence on critical optimization decisions and make certain that we are getting the work in the hands of the contractors in the shortest time frame possible. So I wanna note that Caltrans ongoing coordination with CDT and our state and federal resource agency partners to ensure programmatic efforts are in place for Caltrans construction projects could also be available for the alternative delivery, such as joint builds. So for those joint build projects constructed in the state highway right away, Caltrans will share with the joint builders the programmatic approaches available to them. Caltrans will also share our guidance document with the joint builders to inform them of policies, flexibilities, and streamline approaches, as well as help to help facilitate the partnership between the districts and, and the joint builders. Further, Caltrans will also be the NEPA lead, which allows us to leverage our NEPA assignment and the associated streamline approvals for the alternative delivery locations. In fact, the Caltrans districts in Los Angeles and San Bernardino counties are currently coordinating with Arcadian in preparation of their construction of the 306 mile joint build between Los Angeles and Needles in Southern California. And so even as Caltrans offers this support and guidance, I want to highlight the ongoing progress Caltrans teams are making on the environmental right-of-way permitting and approvals for the miles that we will be constructing. And I will touch on those in the next slide. So for the approximately 35% of the network that Caltrans will construct, 
We are verifying the optimization decisions for the project segments and confirming the schedules. I'm sorry, go back, not ready to move forward. So we are verifying the optimization decisions for the project segments and confirming the schedules so that we can report on the delivery plan at the next MMAC meeting. And in the meantime, we have been coordinating with contractors to identify opportunities for innovations in the construction methods. And we will continue to engage with them, as Mr. Monroe mentioned, to also get input on the installation of the infrastructure to identify any additional cost saving opportunities. Okay, next slide. And as mentioned at previous MMAC meetings, we benefit from the Caltrans established partnerships and relationships that we have with our programmatic partners and, and permitting partners. So some programmatic permitting that we've talked about, um, one is the statutory exemption with CEQA that was provided via uh, SB 156. The other is the Caltrans NEPA assignment from Federal Highway Administration. Another one, the stormwater permit required by the State Water Board, also referred to as the Construction General Permit and also the programmatic agreement for the cultural and historical preservation approvals through the State Historical Preservation Office, also referred to as the Section 106 programmatic agreement. Since the last MMAC meeting, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has issued their programmatic permit, also referred to as the Regional General Permit, under the Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. And close on its heels, we anticipate the State Water Board to issue its Section 401 programmatic permit related to water quality and waste discharge requirements. And lastly, for every project, even with the programmatic approach, approaches, the district teams are applying a strategy of avoidance. As they conduct studies and perform field reviews, they can adjust the project to avoid the need for certain permits. And then, as I mentioned earlier, these programmatic approaches for environmental, per, per, I'm sorry, environmental approvals and permits are available for the alternative delivery, such as the joint build efforts. The streamlining process developed for Caltrans to construct uh, the broadband projects are also available to the joint builders should they choose to utilize them. And because of Caltrans NEPA assignment, the joint builders will benefit from the Caltrans programmatic permitting option, such as the section 106 programmatic agreement that I mentioned earlier. All right, next slide. And so, as I mentioned, Caltrans is focused on handing work over to contractors and getting shovels in the ground. This, this slide shows one of the first work orders we expect to issue for a 10 mile segment in Mendocino County on State Route 20 from the junction of US 101 to the Lake County line. We also anticipate issuing a work order for a nearly eight mile segment on Interstate 5 in Shasta County. And by the end of this year, we anticipate issuing work orders to contractors for more than a dozen segments across the state. This includes projects in the various counties, including Lake, San Joaquin, Alameda, Santa Clara, Los Angeles, Ventura, Riverside, and San Diego counties. This concludes the Caltrans update. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Benton. All right, uh, does any of the members in on the dais have any questions or comments? All right, I, Secretary I Tom. do, I feel like I'm the most talkative. Sorry guys, I know it's Friday morning. You guys wanna get, get this done. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Benton for that update. I just, one thing I wanted to maybe uh, get a clarification on, um, there was a lot of work that was being done on the pre-construction. Uh, planning, you know, for the 10,000 mile, regardless whether it's construction or lease, and and appreciate Caltrans to doing that. Just really from a time saving aspect. Now that there's more uh, certainty in term of uh, uh, with the combination of Caltrans bill and joint bill, there's still a good 50 percent construction still going on. So is it is it true that the, even the joint build um, constructors will be able to take advantage of all the pre-construction work, the permitting work specifically that is already in progress? So ultimately, the goal here is to save time and move you know these construction faster, irregardless who's actually you know doing the actual construction work. Yeah. So any work product that we produced on any of those miles, um, regardless of Caltrans building or not, we will be handing over to CDT and then they can share that with with their other partners with the, the other delivery methods. So absolutely, everybody can leverage any of that work that has been completed. 
That's great to hear. And then and then follow our question to that, that even though the phase one is about 8,300 mile, that phase two it is still very much in progress. And all of those pre-construction work would also in, in fact become a time saving uh, when phase two is, you know, it's about to, you know, when, when that is ready to trigger. So all of those permitting work, everything will be ready. Yeah. So we're not stopping on the phase two miles. We're continuing to focus on, or we're continuing to focus on the phase one as the priority, but we are continuing to work on the phase two miles as well. Excellent. Thank you for that. Thank you, Secretary Tong. All right. Do I have any members online that have any questions? No. Um, again, one more time in the room. Thank you, Ms. Benton. Excellent uh, progress there. Uh, the next update we have is from Golden State Net and uh, Tony Nguyen. Thank you very much, Director. Um, I'm Tony Naughton, President and Chief Operating Officer of Golden State Net. And I'll start out by saying it's great to be here in person for the first time at this meeting. And uh, thank you for that opportunity. I'm going to provide an overview today on the significant amount of work volume uh, for network development and early business and product development uh, since the time of the last MMAC meeting that Golden State Net has been engaged in. Uh, this includes network planning and new build construction and IRUs planning, network engineering, procurement support, uh, operational and support, uh, uh, support service planning, product management and business development. I'll provide uh, uh, updates on all those areas in this presentation. It's also worth noting that uh, over the last uh, 90 plus days, Golden State Net has grown significantly in its uh, direct and contractor staff uh, engaged in this execution project uh, over the next uh, two to three years. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work going on with regard to network development and engineering of the network. This includes uh, right of way and permitting, uh, and that work is is uh, getting towards completion, especially with regard to network routes that go beyond and off of the Caltrans right of way in certain limited instances. Uh, uh, with regard to huts and hut systems, which I've spoken uh, about previously in meetings. Uh, the specifications and analysis work for those are nearing completion and, and have been largely completed for a while, although the last remaining hut locations, uh, particularly those with regard to off-route, uh, off-Caltrans right-of-way, uh, those are really the remaining few that need to be finalized, as well as analysis of um, power loads and heat dissipation within those huts to ensure that they uh, perform uh, and the equipment inside of them perform in an optimal fa uh, optimal fashion. Uh, additionally, acceptance testing protocols and processes, both for the optical fiber assembly as well as the hut hut systems assemblies, are being worked out as part of the uh, QA and quality control processes that we are uh, focused on for these uh, two assemblies. Uh, there are also multiple procurement processes that we are providing support for. Uh, of course, in the past, I've mentioned uh, uh, back office systems, as they're called, for things like uh, customer relationship management, uh, uh, billing, inventory, those types of things. And of course, uh, we're continuing to support uh, the procurement efforts with regard to both the uh, active and passive electronics that will uh, support this network system. Um, it's worth noting also there's been significant done uh, work done recently with regard to uh, uh, the network uh, lab that we will need uh, in conjunction with this effort, uh, specification and, and procurement work uh, 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 for that laboratory. The lab is uh, quite important to validate the design of the network management overlay, validate and confirm uh, optimal configurations for network devices. Uh, long before they're ever deployed in the field, so we can make sure that the network is uh, not only uh, optimal in its performance, but also can be uh, upscaled with capacity uh, as needed in the years ahead. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So we've been working very closely always with CDT, of course, and, and, and always with Caltrans with CDT. Um, a significant amount of work product has been created to integrate the work product and, and, and planning efforts from all the agencies involved uh, uh, so that uh, all uh, uh, joint uh, or, uh, job order contractors uh, 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 have clear indication and direction as to what their responsibilities will be. 
um, uh, with regard to both hut and fiber assemblies, both of which are civil engineering, as we've referred to in the past. Um, we're putting quite a bit of work on the development approach for the construction of these assemblies, uh, and particularly those, as I mentioned a moment ago, that are uh, in some limited instances off or beyond the Caltrans right-of-way. Uh, significant and complex tasks uh, are involved here, uh, even though they are limited in number, um, uh, and it, it, uh, it has to do with um, getting off that right-of-way uh, and continuing on with construction of the optical fiber plant, and then, of course, the uh, HUD assemblies themselves, and doing in a way that uh, maximizes efficiency so that when we have uh, so-called boots and machinery on the ground that have uh, fulfilled their construction uh, work uh, to the end of a Caltran right-of-way, but the route carries beyond that right-of-way, uh, those resources can remain there and, and continue on to uh, continue with that work and meet up with the uh, right-of-way uh, uh, down the road, so to speak. Um, we're coordinating with CDT and Caltrans to develop workable processes and approaches for field engineering inspection of the uh, optical fiber assemblies and the HUT systems assemblies to make sure they are um, meeting our specifications and, of course, will perform in an optimal, may, optimal way once the uh, network is in production itself. Uh, and uh, in a network of this size, that's a considerable effort uh, and quite important to ensure that um, we minimize uh, uh, network events and, and interruptions in service uh, to uh, the highest degree possible uh, and, and operate the network in a, in a reliable, consistent fashion, as I've said before, uh, as a carrier class type of network uh, is the uh, standard of performance that we are intending to bring to this, uh, to this operation. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. I think it's also um, worth noting that we're now in the early stages of business development and uh, product management. Uh, as the operator of the network under the third party administrator agreement, we of course will be taking these services uh, and products to market on behalf of uh, CDT. Uh, along the lines of business development and sales, uh, current key activities include refinement of the go-to-market plan for direct sales and channel distribution sales. Uh, revenue forecasting, both near-term and long-term, uh, because the network, of course, must be self-sustaining and uh, have the ability from revenues generated to uh, support maintenance and operation costs over the years ahead. Uh, planning, recruiting, and building a sales organization that will consist of account executives and sales engineers and sales administration and the processes needed to uh, 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 run the sales and go-to-market effort in as uh, optimal fashion as possible. Uh, on the product management side, this involves analysis of market geographies. Uh, first of all, of course, accounting for unserved and underserved areas, uh, carriers and service providers uh, who will serve those areas and other areas as well, uh, right. and, and government and enterprise customers who will be able to take advantage and use this network if they care to as an open access network, as we've talked about uh, in previous meetings. Uh, we're further developing the product service catalog from the standpoint of the customer marketplace, uh, requirements by customer type, projecting product and service market demands, uh, true product management uh, for the products and services that will be offered on this network. And that also, of course, quite importantly includes economic and pricing analysis for the products and services. And as Mr. Monroe mentioned, uh, those must be provided uh, under SB 156 at or below market rates. Uh, so there's quite a bit of uh, product uh, economic analysis work taking place uh, in that regard. Um, quite important to note here is the amount of work that we have been engaged with alongside CDT uh, to uh, uh, engage and participate in multiple outreach meetings around the state focused on broadband equity. These have been local and regional community outreach meetings focusing on uh, program solutions uh, for towns, cities, regions, and quite importantly, of course, for tribal communities around the state. Um, uh, there have been ongoing communications and work with numerous tribes, uh, both those uh, on the Caltrans right-of-way and those that are not on the Caltrans right-of-way, 
uh, numerous individual and regional tribal meetings have taken place to provide information about this network. Uh, and especially after those meetings, after those regional and local meetings I referred to, uh, follow-up meetings with uh, tribal representatives and other community members on site to make sure that they have a full understanding of the capabilities and service offerings of this network uh, uh, as well. Um, we've worked closely with CDT as well to be a key source of information to tribes and other community organizations about multiple available funding sources for the development and uh, connection of last mile networks uh, uh, in addition to the uh, funding uh, available from the CPUC, there are other federal programs that uh, CDT and, and GSN are making sure uh, communities, and in particular tribal communities, are aware of and can take advantage of. Um, it's also worth noting here a very important uh, type of work involving the tribes, and that's negotiation and coordination with tribes in cases where network routes may be crossing tribal lands. Uh, a, a very important aspect um, uh, given the nature of tribal lands and um, we're spending quite a bit of time uh, on that effort as well. Um, and uh, with that said, that actually concludes my presentation. I'm happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Naughton. It's a pleasure always to get an update for our third party administrator. Uh, this time I'm going to go to uh, online first to see if there's any questions. None at this time. Okay. Any, I would like to, okay. President Reynolds. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for the presentation as very detailed and informative as usual. So I really appreciated it. Um, I have a question about um, just to make sure I and the public understand the terminology you referred to a network lab and yes. the uh, procurement and specifications that you're working on for that. Could you explain what that is? Sure. It's essentially a, um, a contained environment, uh, not on the production network itself, and in most cases, heavily utilized in advance of uh, deployment of network or network segments. Um, it's essentially an environment that allows us to make sure, first of all, that the network management uh, uh, system, which of course is responsible, uh, it's a piece of software that monitors the network on a 724, 365 basis, making sure that is uh, uh, set up and configured uh, properly. Um, a network orchestrator tool, uh, which is uh, intended to um, uh, not only perfect uh, the devices on the uh, routing and switch config, uh, routing and switching uh, 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 devices themselves, but um, to optimize those configurations and then automate the ability to install those configurations as software on the uh, routing and switching devices. And then uh, certain other types of network engineering testing, if you will, with regard to application support, uh, network security, uh, always good to um, uh, specify and confirm these various kinds of capabilities in an offline environment before we're actually deploying network in the field. So it's, a, it's really a, a confirmation and testing environment, if you will. Okay, great. And then um, I appreciate the summary of the community and tribal outreach. And I know that um, all of the state entities have been doing a lot of outreach, including the work yes. that Mr. Adams is doing and that CPUC staff is doing. And I just wanted to make sure that Golden State Net is, is coordinating the outreach and, and that your extended invitation to reach out to CPUC staff, if we can provide any information to the extent that we don't have folks yes. there. Yeah, uh, uh, physically. Yes. Um, and, and quite frankly, I think um, we could do more of that type of outreach than we have uh, been able to up to this point. And uh, I just this week have had some discussions along those lines. Uh, and uh, uh, one of our staff members uh, is uh, particularly familiar with the processes and uh, individuals at the commission. And uh, uh, she is working to um, really uh, create a, a continual interface uh, and communication and information provision for these purposes. Uh, we're, we're more than ready to do that now, and we want to make sure we're well coordinated uh, with the PUC as well as with our agency partners. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. President Reynolds, any other questions? Yes, Secretary. Uh, a a follow-up one is... Um, I want to echo uh, President Reno's call. It's, I, you know, as you can probably folks have seen on the presentation thus far, and there's more to come, right? It is a very complex 
um, work involve uh, from, you know, building the middle mile as the super digital highway. And then we're going to hear from CPUC on what that coordination looks like on the last mile, because without the last mile, the, the middle mile doesn't mean anything, right? To ultimately lead to uh, every household gets connected. And from there, there's a whole outreach program. I know we're going to hear from Mr. Adam later on that the whole digital uh, equity plan that is being created from all of these um, engagement that you all had. So digital literacy and all of that, making it affordable, which is the, the you know, all those needs to all, like all the star needs to align in order for this work. So from that aspect, I, you know, I would just call out not only to our third party administrator, but CDT, CPUC, Caltrend, for even, you know, the contractors who's helping all of this construction. Um, this is a massive undertaking. And I, 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 I don't know if people realize how historic this can be and also how massive and complex this can be. So to the degree that um, everybody understand their role impacts other so that therefore encourage that level of coordination, I think it would go a long way that even though all of this complexity is behind the scene, but by the time our community hears it, our household, those needing to this is simple for them, right? They don't have to figure out all the alphabet soups, what this all this means. So that's maybe one more of a statement than a question. And, and, and well noted, if I'll go ahead, yeah. please. And two, I was actually, sorry. Um, so that's more of a statement. And two, I do want to applaud um, you know, go to stay net for your continual effort. Um, again, a lot of conversation right now is just getting, you know, the, the miles bill, uh, meeting our commitment with a 10,000 mile, and then how is the last mile coordinated. But the whole operating of the network, go to market and, you know, testing all the connection before it's get a turn on. Those work, it's really, you know, requires a lot of planning ahead as well. So the last thing we want is you have line ready, but they're not ready to turn on. That's just going to be, you know, we're losing time over that. So I just want to applaud you all for continue or already moving ahead on the business development plan from go to market strategy, as well as um, getting the network to be turned on. Because all of these will become a on a flow basis, right? We're not waiting for 2026 or whatever the year after is as soon as these lines becomes available, gets connected last mile, we're go. So I appreciate you guys' this, uh, proactiveness on that. Thank you, Secretary. We appreciate the acknowledgement of those things. Um, with regard to your first point, uh, it's interesting because actually Director Bailey Crimmins and I were touching on this this morning in an earlier discussion. Uh, there are multiple concurrent activities going on in the execution of this, uh, of this network. Um, and that's a bit different. Uh, than it would be, for example, in a typical commercial network build. Um, in a commercial network deployment and, and build effort, I would say it's more sequential in nature. Uh, and sequences in those efforts can overlap and typically do. In this effort, it would be more accurate to describe, to describe it as if we are engaging and executing multiple sequences, more or less all at the same time. And that has to do with two, two things. First and foremost, a very important aspect of this entire program, which is time to service. How quickly can we deliver this to those who need it most? And those who need it most, of course, are unserved and underserved uh, communities and households and small businesses in those unserved places. And second, um, of course, the time constraints under the federal funding of this program, uh, which we are not assuming will be extended in any fashion. And therefore, the concurrent execution of all these sequential activities as one single activity uh, does indeed, to your point, uh, require quite a bit of planning, coordination, communication, and trust. And um, we're, we've been very focused on that challenge since the early days, going back nearly two years ago. And um, we continue to enjoy the opportunity to work very closely with CDT, uh, with Caltrans, with PUC, uh, and in particular, the communities that are to be served by this important and historic program, because um, I think it's important to note, and we all know this, but I'll say it, this, this effort is about people. It's about serving people who have not been served. And in most instances, they need this the most. Uh, tribal areas, urban locations and major uh, metropolitan centers, uh, neighborhoods of color, um, these are the objectives of this program, as well as servicing others uh, 
uh, in, in the state. And, um, and also providing an opportunity for those who are on the enterprise or service provider side to um, uh, expand their network uh, usage and capabilities in a more affordable fashion, which I think is good for the commerce of California as well. So um, again, thank you for this opportunity. Yes, Mr. McKeever. I know we're pressed for time. I'll try to make it a very direct question, hopefully a quick answer. You spoke at length about the huts. Can you talk about one for the public's benefit? What is a hut? Sure. Can you talk about Caltrans' role in delivering the huts? We talked primarily about the um, installation, I think, of fiber and conduit. And then how many huts are we talking about? I'll address the last question first, if I might, so I don't forget. Uh, over the 8,300 miles in phase one, we currently are looking at approximately, if not exactly, 161 huts. And these huts, uh, perform multiple functions, the primary function of which is a reamplification of the signal on the optical fiber. Approximately every 50 miles, uh, the, the signal has to be reamplified so it doesn't diminish. Uh, uh, and that's the uh, traditional and primary purpose of these huts. In this program, we're also using the huts as an important uh, a distributed way of aggregating access to the network. Uh, as Mr. Monroe has mentioned, we're um, uh, in relative terms to the commercial carrier world, for example, we are generously dropping access of vaults about every half mile. Uh, and these can accommodate uh, splice ins from last mile providers and other customers or users uh, uh, who otherwise wouldn't be able to necessarily use a uh, so-called layer two transport circuit from an existing provider in their area to access the network. So uh, amplification of the signal and reamplification access. And then a third important use of the huts has to do with um, uh, distributed co-location of uh, two important uh, things, our network switching infrastructure, the routers and switches that will provide these services are being distributed as closely to the virtual edge of the network as possible by placing them in huts, as opposed to more centralized locations such as central offices or data centers. So getting that switching fabric out there to the edge of the network uh, improves performance uh, and, and latency for everyone and keeps uh, local traffic local as opposed to having to uh, transit it to an exchange point that can be and typically would be hundreds of miles away just to come back for an interaction between two people or who are in a single geographic location. So um, the other aspect is co-location of third party uh, servers. There will be uh, enterprise and civic community organization customers who wish to place their uh, network presence or network usage application and services on servers. And these, these huts, though not extraordinarily large in size, will be large enough to accommodate um, uh, co-location uh, uh, for these purposes. Um, the huts are not technically data centers, but they are being engineered and specified and will be deployed as if they are small versions of data centers, if you will, both for network integrity purposes and also to maintain a very good, strong security around these huts since they will be unmanned. We don't want these uh, hut assets to be vandalized or abused, of course, in any way possible that would uh, endanger the operation of the network. Ms. Ben, do, can you speak to the role of Caltrans with the delivery of the huts? Yeah, sorry, you did ask about that. Yeah. So we are working closely with Caltrans in this regard because the huts and the hut systems that go inside the huts are part of civil engineering. And this is an important uh, piece of it, not only in terms of the coordination we're doing with Janice and her team uh, right now, but once we're in the deployment and uh, execution processes in the field. Um, the quality assurance inspectors I mentioned earlier will play a key role, certainly on the fiber assembly construction, but especially on the hut and hut systems to ensure quality assurance, to ensure they can they pass acceptance testing. Uh, as I've mentioned before, the huts are a very critical aspect of this. Uh, we want to avoid situations where you have problems with any of the huts from day one, of course. Uh, my experience over many years has been when you have that type of issue in an amplification facility or reamplification facility, it, it can, so to speak, become a problem child, if you will. 
And we want to make sure we avoid that problem by making these cuts uh, uh, perform as perfectly as possible from day one. So we're we're on the quality assurance part of the uh, fiber and HUD assemblies, but it's particularly important. It's always important, but especially with regard to the HUD and HUD systems assemblies, which are very complex. And there are 161 opportunities to do it right the first time, and we intend to do that. Thank you, Mr. McKeever. That's an excellent question. All right. I think that concludes uh, the Golden State Net uh, update. We'll go ahead and uh, share. I've got a couple of questions online. Oh, yes. I apologize. Okay. Uh, Supervisor. All right. <laughs> Supervisor. Uh, so, thank you very much. I wanted to take a moment just to um, recognize the work and outreach to our tribal governments. I think that's, uh, that's uh, an area that doesn't get um, spoken about very much. So I, my question was just... Um, uh, and to the point about the information being provided to tribal governments for connecting last mile, could you elaborate more on whether tribes are applying to draw down those resources um, and also whether um, they're provided any technical help um, with these types of last mile projects and um, and all the other requirements that come along with with grants. Supervisor Alejo, um, I think that would probably be an excellent question for CPUC. Maybe if I go ahead and, um, Maria, I don't know if you want to answer that question now, or if you want to go ahead and include it as part of your presentation. Hi. Um, I'm certainly happy to answer it now. Um, I was going to touch on it a little bit, but yes, we've done some excellent uh, engagement um, in partnership with CDT, which Scott will talk about shortly. Um, and specifically to tribes of the uh, We've done four regional, uh, pardon me, three regional and one statewide virtual consultation um, jointly uh, and have done some great engagement from that and gotten great feedback that is going to be part of the record for us on our B proceeding. In addition, as a result of that, the CPUC has also received requests from 26 requests for individual consultations, and um, we will be we are scheduling those currently and we'll be doing conducting those as part of the B proceeding. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. All right. For Wood? Assemblymember Wood. I pass. <laughs> okay. He, he said he will pass. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. We'll go ahead and go to uh, what's going on with the Office of Broadband and Digital Literacy with Scott Adams. And thank you, Mr. Naughton, for everything that you do. Thank you, Chair Bailey Crimmins, and um, good afternoon, uh, committee members and members of the public. Um, my name is Scott Adams. I'm the Deputy Director of Broadband and Digital Literacy at the Department of Technology. Um, and it's my pleasure to give a, a brief but important update on the um, stakeholder engagement that has gone on over the last uh, couple of months since the last meeting. If we could move to the next slide, please. Um, so I really wanted to stress, I think it's been reiterated before that um, broadband for all and the related programs are incredibly complex and um, multifaceted, interdependent and complementary um, to get to the goal, which is to serve um, residents and have them thriving in this technological world that we're doing. So to that end, um, we have taken great care of both the Department of Technology, the Public Utilities Commission, Caltrans and other state agencies. Um, and have engaged with thousands of California residents and stakeholders over the last many months on um, all of the broadband for all programs and initiatives and specifically the middle and the last mile, because um, it's really important to, to always pair those two together, given how critical they are to, to one another. And the various formats that we've engaged with folks have been in, um, you know, large scale virtual meetings, um, in-person regional meetings um, to get out behind the computer screen and to really hear the lived in community experiences in person, because that's what's most important. Um, as others have noted, there's been many individual meetings and consultations with um, cities, counties, tribes, other um, entities. And uh, we do communicate as uh, Deputy Director Monroe had mentioned through a, a monthly um, broadband for all email update that we all collaborate on um, 
and have built a, a database of about 5,000 California stakeholders and partners that we communicate on a monthly basis with about um, updates on all the various points and house um, information on the Broadband for All portal and other supported websites. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Really want to let the, the images speak for themselves and not so much the words. And so um, the, the big highlight, I know Tony touched about it in part of uh, GSN's um, update and Maria spoke briefly, but um, we've been on the road for the last um, several months and have conducted um, what amounts to 20 broadband for all digital equity and bead planning, uh, regional planning workshops in every economic region throughout the state. Um, and uh, have conducted three um, separate um, group tribal consultations in partnership with the Public Utilities Commission um, that are aligned in the, the you know, Southern California tribes, the Central California tribes, and the Northern California tribes. And um, what is really important for you all to know, because we've heard Secretary Tong mention the, the complex nature of these programs and um, you know just understanding and navigating how these work and complement one another. The focus of these workshops has been to really um, update residents on the existing broadband for all investments and efforts, which included the middle mile, the last mile, and the massive um, statewide mobilization to increase enrollment in the FCC's um, affordable connectivity program, which is critically important to adoption um, and not necessarily a sequential step, but something that happens concurrently. Um, these workshops have also provided the Department of Technology and PUC a critical opportunity to engage directly with um, residents and community-based organizations and local jurisdictions to get their direct feedback on inputs for the state's digital equity plan and the bead plan, which are going to draw down um, additional, you know, billions of federal dollars or already have um, to support the aims of broadband for all. Um, and then lastly, um, what we have also done, hearing from the committee and the legislature and um, the, the ecosystem is built in a, a broadband infrastructure planning workshops at each of these regional planning workshops where we had the Department of Technologies, um, Middle Mile Broadband Initiative team and GSN go over the, the um, construction evaluation map and kind of talk through how the Middle Mile was going to impact um, their uh, communities and entities within their um, and then, you know, PUC really would do the next portion of the workshop and, and explain, here's the suite of last mile programs that, you know, whether it's the California Advanced Service Fund or um, I'll let Maria speak about the programs. I don't want to steal her thunder, but our intent was to get those um, two entities together with um, local ISPs and planners and other entities that were looking to leverage both um, to support their understanding of um, that the programs are available, but how to tap into them and work as expeditiously as we are on that. Another point I would say is that our team um, and GoBiz uh, also built in a component of that to um, educate folks about the local jurisdiction permitting playbook, because as important as permitting is to the middle mile, it's going to be equally important to um, expediting the deployment of the last mile infrastructure programs that are funded by or, or um, projects that are funded by the PUC programs. So um, just want to say it's been an incredibly um, valuable experience. I think that um, the opportunity has helped our um, individual entities come together in partnership and, and really present one face of California um, for broadband for all. Um, and it's allowed us to have a deeper understanding of um, the communities and their very specific needs. And so um, what we'd like to leave you with is to add some dimension to what these workshops look like is, um, if we go to the next slide, um, courtesy of the uh, San Joaquin Valley Regional Broadband Consortia and the um, folks at CSU Fresno, they actually produced a two minute short of the uh, workshop that we did um, down in Fresno. We wanted to play that for you so you got a, a sense of what those events look like. Thank you, we'll go and tee up the video. Fortunately, we all live in a state 
that has been thinking about broadband for many years and has just needed some additional tools to make sure there is broadband for all. So um, we are very excited to partner with California and each of you, each of the counties across the state, because so many of you have been working on this and saying there's an issue for a while, but now's the time you know, to really take your knowledge, take your experiences and turn them into a plan that results in actual broadband, in actual training. We have imminent need here. Um, and as, even though we are one of the most progressive states in the country, um, there are still huge disparities in some of our rural communities in the Central Valley. Affordability impacts all of us. It impacts adoption. And we have students doing homework in their cars. We have students doing homework on the city bus because that's where broadband is because they don't have broadband in their home and yet they live in Fresno and everybody thinks Fresno's covered. It's not. I have students who live in Amina and we gave them a Wi-Fi, but it doesn't make a difference because there's no connectivity out there. One of the ways is by trying to expand the universe of broadband providers. So we're not just relying solely on internet service providers. We're trying to empower counties, empower cities, empower joint powers authority, empower tribes to bring broadband to those places that have been ignored. So all of us need to work together to make sure that folks in Fresno, the surrounding communities and the region um, know about this program and are able to connect to it. Thank you, Mr. Moreau. Good, we could, uh, do you have another slide that you want to go over? Uh, no, that completes my presentation. Thank you. I, I just want to um, state what an what an heartfelt, uh, this really is taking uh, what we're doing and working so hard behind the scenes and putting it out there where it really matters. And uh, obviously CP, C, CPUC, um, uh, Golden State Net, CDT, uh, California Emerging Technology Fund, the CBOs, the individuals, the leaders that showed up locally all across the state, the tribal leaders, um, just to talk to us about the barriers and making sure that we were staying true to the true north of why we're all doing this. So my hat's off to everyone that participated and just excellent work. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chair Bailey Cremins. And, and I really wanted to thank you for um, teeing that up is that none of these regional planning workshops could have occurred without the um, really support and close collaboration of the regional um, partners that we had. And so uh, chief among them, the, you know, the, the regional broadband consortiums throughout the state, the metropolitan planning organizations, SCAG and SANDAG down in Southern California, and a number of um, other CBOs like Oakland Undivided helping put together the Barry event. It really was um, a team effort. And so, you know, it, it, in addition to expanding and bringing the state team closer, I think it helped us build um, you know, a broader state team um, with the other folks. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. I'm going to go ahead and open up remotely to any of the members that have any questions or comments. Okay, not at this time. I will look to my left and right to my colleagues. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> And we're going to go ahead and shift to the next agenda item, which is the um, Public Utilities Commission and Ms. Maria Ellis. Hi, good morning, committee members. Uh, again, my name is Maria Ellis. I'm the Deputy Director for Broadband at the California Public Utilities Commission. I'm going to talk a little bit about our programs under SB 156 for Last Mile and some other related programs. Next slide, please. Um, I want to start first with the federal funding account, which provides almost $2 billion in grants to deliver reliable broadband to help close the digital divide to unserved communities. The goal of this fund is to provide direct connection to unserved locations and end users. I am thrilled to announce that as of June 30th, um, the CPUC is now accepting applications for this count. Um, for program eligibility um, locations that are, the locations that are eligible for this program are those that are um, lacking reliable wireline connection, um, capable of 25 megabits per second up, up uh, download and three upload. Additionally, after 
funding, the expectation is that the service that is provided is 100 megabits per second symmetrical. Um, a variety of entities are, uh, as you know, are uh, option um, eligible for this, including local governments, tribes, um, joint powers authorities, ISPs, um, a variety of individuals uh, and, and uh, indi pardon me, individual organizations. Um, I want to touch very quickly on the connection between our partners in Middle Mile. Um, applicants that are proposing to uh, connect back to Middle Mile as part of their last mile applications will be required to consult with CDT first before submitting their applications to ensure that that is um, properly coordinated. And in addition, uh, there is a rubric, um, there is a point allocation within our rubric uh, for these applications if it's connected to the state middle mile. Um, and certainly, as all the other presenters have mentioned, we continue to work really closely on this as um, an update uh, our, our, our information very regularly to ensure that we are um, good alignment. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the things, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Can you go back one? Thank you. That was, um, um, one of the things that I want to mention here is the, uh, application window for the, uh, uh, for the federal funding account, like I said, opened on June 30th and it will close on September 29th, 2023. Um, at 4 p.m. It's a very specific time frame. Um, that's a three-month window. The reason that we've um, allocated such a long window is because we know that this is a new grant program and we want to be able to provide people the time and energy from inside our agency to, to, to help them in their developing their applications. We do anticipate awarding the first round of grants um, in, in the first quarter of 2024, and at that same quarter, opening up a second round of um, applications. And then there will be an additional round um, of, of, of applications um, as set forth in the state budget. We encourage anyone who wants to know more about um, how to, how to um, access this resource and um, all of the tools that we've developed to check out our website. Next slide, please. So this slide is out of order. Um, can you please move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, yes, next slide. Thank you. Um, since we know that these slides are made available publicly, um, we wanted to be able to provide folks some resources that they can um, point to for the if they are interested in applying. Um, the, these are all linked resources here. Um, it includes our obviously our webpage, our grant portal, our video tutorials. And what you see on the side there is just a map, a snapshot of our public map that indicates the areas that are eligible um, for funding um, because they are unserved. Next slide. All right. Um, on to the local area, um, uh, local agency technical assistance, pardon me. This program was also funded out of SB 156 and provided $50 million in technical assistance to both local governments and or tribes um, uh, to launch work, basically the foundational work that it takes to uh, launch a network or expand a network. From this uh, $45 million, 45 of that was um, set aside for, uh, for non-tribal communities, so local governments. Five million was set aside for tribes and tribal nations. Uh, we actually have a dashboard on our website that has information about um, uh, the awards that we've made and applications we've received. And if you look at the map on the side there, that is a snapshot of, of that dashboard. Um, since August 2022 through uh, this June, we've received 126 applications requesting $56.6 million. Um, obviously more than we had, uh, uh, than was available. Um, of these 26, uh, 126 applications, 56 out of the 58 counties in California were covered. Um, while we are no longer taking applications at this time, I do want to note, uh, because we are um, either fully committed and or requested, we have some applications that we've just received that we are evaluating, um, I do want to note an important uh, resource for tribes. Um, the California Advanced Services Fund has a tribal technical assistance fund that continues to be available um, for tribes to tap into so that they can continue their work in, in, uh, on, uh, on that front. 
Um, I think this program just illustrates the fact that we have been so oversubscribed just illustrates the need and the demand from communities and tribal nations to be able to kind of be masters of their own destiny in terms of closing the digital divide. Um, and so um, we continue to hear requests for more funding on this front. Next slide, please. California Advanced Services Fund. Um, so this continues to serve as an important tool in, uh, under broadband for all and closing the digital divide. Um, we made some uh, program improvements um, on several of these fronts last year uh, to the adoption account, um, to the broad, broadband consortia account, and also um, made adjustments into the infrastructure account to um, implement some of the legislative uh, requirements required for project eligibility. This year, the Commission is exploring um, improvements to the public housing account, um, specifically to low income housing developments and mobile parks. On the adoption side, these grants are meant to help entities and community based organizations um, uh, deliver digital literacy and broadband access programs. The CPUC awarded 32 projects uh, in, um, in January from the cycle that ended in January 2023. We awarded 32 projects of, um, for a total of $2.72 million. In July 1, uh, the application that just window that just closed, uh, we received 87 applications requesting $14.24 million. And I just want to note here that while we were on the road together uh, during this road show and all of the engagement that we're hearing, um, we continue to hear the, not only the importance of having basic access to this technology, but also education around how to use it. And so we do understand, you know, the fact that we received um, so many applications in this last round really illustrates the need for digital literacy, um, um, education, and resources in the state. Um, in for the uh, infrastructure grant account, um, we this subsidizes the cost um, of last mile and middle mile infrastructure to expand um, quality communications to um, to end users in California. Um, we just closed our last window uh, for funding um, on June first, and we received seventy three applications requesting five hundred and twenty seven million in pro um, in programming, and so um, that is by far I think our our largest request to date for this fund. The public housing account, and um, so as, as the name states, is um, uh, as the title talks about, is really targeted towards helping bring connection to um, uh, 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 housing that is either uh, low income housing or um, public housing. And where I've expanded that definition to also address other kinds of housing where we know um, particularly disadvantaged communities might be dwelling. This award um, in, in the Jan January 2023 cycle, we awarded 31 grants for a total 1.52 million. And recently we just received 14 grants uh, to, uh, requesting a total of a little over 873,000. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna talk about this slide much. I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, the, the, the tools that are, are available to us. One thing um, we have talked about the technical, uh, the technical assistance, that's the LADA fund. And I've talked about the federal funding and the California Advanced Services Fund, which is all of those um, six public purpose programs. Um, one thing to note is that we are currently working on the loan loss reserve program, and we uh, the it is an expectation that commission may take some action on that later this year. Next slide. Okay, so I want to go back up to the top because I think I my slides were out of order here. So I'm going to start with bead. <laughs> Um, so, you know, under Broadband for All, we've got these great resources and tools that we've brought together under with all of our joint efforts um, and, and the leadership from um, the governor and the legislature under Broadband for All and SB 156. We now have another tool in our quiver, if you will, which is the BEAD program. Um, and in late June, the Her Biden Harris administration, in conjunction with the NTIA, announced that California will be receiving $1.86 billion in federal funding um, for the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, otherwise known as BEAD. Um, so we are extremely thrilled um, to be to have this award. Um, this is just again like another 
uh, opportunity for us to um, be able to close that last mile and really bring connection to um, all Californians. The primary, again, similar to FFA, the primary goal of BEAD is to deploy reliable last mile service um, to all unserved <laughs> locations in California. <laughs> For the purposes of this program, the NTA has um, uh, uh, has defined unserved as um, those lacking access to speeds at um, 25 megabits per second download and three upload um, and uh, via reliable technology. And they have defined, um, the NTI has defined reliable technology as um, fiber or advanced cable wireline connections and where this is not feasible, fixed wireless um, and other alternative technologies can be considered. Um, the CPUC is moving forward with establishing rules um, for the, through this public deliberative process. Um, uh, we are uh, again part of what of the goal of uh, CPUC and being on the road with T and, uh, CDT and others not, was not only to talk about our joint efforts overall under SB 156, but also to start getting some intel and insights into that could feed into our bead program and knowing that this was coming down the pike. Um, and so we've received a lot of that and a lot of those uh, that will be attached to as part of the record, as part of the preceding open rulemaking that we have. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, timeline. So this reflects a very high level timeline for BEAD. Um, we are, as mentioned, we are just wrapping up our initial set of um, engagements with CDT. Specific to BEAD, the CPUC will be doing ongoing engagement. And as I mentioned, um, as a result of the joint engagement, we've now got 26 requests um, for one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, with tribal nations with CPUC specific to BEAD. And um, again, those will be part of the record. Um, notable is that we just released, um, one of the requirements for NTI for this funding is the release of a five-year action plan. The CPUC has just published this on um, July 17th for public comment. Um, the we will be receiving comments on uh, initial comments on this through August seventh and reply comments uh, through August fifteenth uh, August eleventh. Pardon me. Um, we will submit this plan and all related comments to NTIA on August twenty eighth. And then from the time from August to December, we'll be spending a lot of time working what, on what is called an initial plan, which is due to NTIA by the end of this year. Um, that initial plan really lays out the meat and the, the nuts and bolts, I guess, if you will, of the program that we will be developing. Um, it will take into account all of the work and engagement that we're doing and um, provide the, the, the outline for what we hope to accomplish with this program. So that will be delivered at the end of 2023. In early 2024, we hope to have an approval for that program from NTIA. And that will launch us into uh, what is real, essentially a 365 day window in which we will um, run, run a challenge process to establish um, eligibility map for the BEAD program and also run um, an application process and a solicitation process for applications. All of this will get wrapped up into what is called our final proposal which is due to NTIA, like I said, 365 days from the time the initial proposal is approved. Um, and once we get approval, we can continue with our grant making. Um, that is a very high level timeline. We will continue, we will be sure to provide additional details as, to the committee as we're moving forward because we know that this will be an important tool, um, again, to, to build out uh, the vision that we've laid out under Broadband for All. And apologies for the mishap with the slides. <laughs> Well, you did a wonderful job being able to navigate that. So thank you, Ms. Ellis. Uh, I will uh, open it up to the members here at the dais to uh, ask questions. Secretary Tong? Uh, not so much of a question, just a, a, a appreciation for both uh, Ms. Ellis and uh, Mr. Adams to talk about your um, community engagement to get lots of feedback. And again, I, I know that, uh, you know, we're talking about here is a very, very complex, uh, you know, so many moving parts and the coordination and timing and, and, you know, with the map update, how you pivot to some of the essential middle mile to deal with the last mile with an updated middle mile. So all of that, I just, uh, just again, just commend for you guys this effort and the tight coordination between the um, organization. Thank you, Secretary Tong. President Reynolds. 
Can I just second that? Um, that was a fantastic comment. I completely agree. Um, there's a lot going on and I really appreciate the outreach to communities and to tribal governments and then the close coordination among all of the agencies. So thank you very much for all of that. Thank you, President Reynolds. Any other comments? Online questions? Have... Okay, online. Assembly Member Berner, please. Assembly Member Berner. Thank you. Um, and thank you for that presentation. And you did do an excellent job uh, navigating the, the slides. I was trying to figure out why we were talking about June 30th uh, opening when I was looking at the bead slides and it occurred to me that they might be out of order. So when you go back and look at the ladder grant, because one of the things I think you probably know I'm very concerned about is you've done all this outreach, but we know we're not getting everybody in California who's unserved. And we know the middle mile, you know, with the phase two, not being yet funded, um, like in my district, there's you know nothing that's in phase one, for example, for the middle mile. So when we're looking at that, one of the things that occurred to me when I was listening to your presentation was you had this over over subscription to the ladder grants, which means people need help, and not everybody got the help. So when you look at the distribution of the grant, the ladder grants that were given, do you feel that matches the proportionality? of the unserved, like, did we get the most bang for a buck with that? And imagine the proportionality of the unserved population. Um, and if they didn't get a ladder grant, how are we helping them, um, applicants, really navigate all the many broadband programs that are out there right now, whether it's BEAD or FFA, they don't all have the same requirements, they're all slightly different. And for some of our very high capacity, really engaged counterparts, I think they probably have it together. And then there's gonna be unserved areas that don't have that kind of local capacity to help apply for the grant and, and do this. Um, so I don't know if you could speak to any of that. Certainly, and thank you. Thank you for the question, uh, Representative Plummer. Um, so I would say that we, we were able to hit uh, 56 out of the 58 counties, which I think is, is, is phenomenal. Um, that said, we do understand that there is outstanding need. Um, currently, that is all the funding that is available um, at this time. However, one of the things that we have done under um, with in establishing our programs is we've developed um, what we are calling, and we're still continuing to stand up, what is called a caseworker unit um, within our division to really help um, uh, package, if you will, um, provide information and resources and lend a hand to um, local communities and tribal governments as we're thinking about developing their applications. And so, um, and as part of this, they've developed a great resource um, specific to tribes that brings together every resource, you know, that we have at our fingertips. Um, and our partners have at our finger, their fingertips too, on one page, right? So that folks can have um, that resource. And so one of the things that they're doing is they're meeting with each county um, and having an intake with each county in California to ensure that they will um, to share information, assess their readiness, what are their needs, um, and so we've we've tried to build that in, knowing that we didn't have enough, possibly enough funding. We are trying to do that through more one-on-one um, uh, -on -one help with our, our caseworker team. Sorry, and did you find you said you covered fifty-six of the fifty-eight counties, but the the unserved population isn't evenly distributed within California, so. When you look at, you know, I don't know, if, I'm sure you looked at this, but if you look at the map of where the most need is, do we have communities that have not gotten ladder grants, but have high need? How, and how are we going to pull, you can go to the counties, but not, not all counties are equally engaged um, in the process. So it's not, to me, the measure of proportionality isn't 56 of 58 counties. That is great that you got 56 of 58, that is wonderful. But the pro the proportional need isn't distributed evenly in California. Yes, agreed. Um, and the counties, the two counties that we are aware of that did not um, get a grant currently are at San Francisco and Stanislaus. And so um, we we I can't say with exact. You know, um, I, I can certainly come back with that information to this committee at their next presentation. Um, but the uh, the intent of that those grants are that of course. Um, with the federal funding account with an emphasis on disadvantaged communities, the intent of the latter grants is to help them build out networks that would reach those unserved communities specifically. 
if if at a later time, or you can just send it over to my office. That would be, or you know, maybe to to this group. I don't know if we need to ha have it in a future meeting, but I think it's really critical because I I always bring up the example of Oceanside. I shouldn't pick on Oceanside because um, I no longer represented a representative for four years. Um, but Oceanside does have a disadvantaged community. In my old district, that's where the greatest need was and the greatest unserved population was. And uh, they don't have the capacity. They don't have a community group that is reaching out to you guys and figuring this out. Um, and so th that remains a concern and especially how the programs all work together, um, you know, especially considering that there are gonna be some areas of the state um, I think it's, I don't want to speak for assembly member Wood, but assembly member Wood was bringing up the example of his 20,000 that were right on a freeway that aren't going to have, you know, they're in middle mile phase two. Um, how are we going to help them with that? Because it is, it's very complex, I think, for us. And we do this a lot as part of our jobs, and even more complex when you don't have the kind of community activists and, and advocates from those communities. So um, I think that's something we need to still be watching out. Thank you, Assemblymember Berner. Is there any other questions from our remote members? Okay, we're gonna go ahead and we'll move on to public comment. Uh, Ms. Alvar Alvarado, <laughs> will you please provide public comment and provide guidelines to make sure I know we have people that are in the room and also online that would like to make comment. Yes, thank you. In order to ensure everyone who wishes to make public comment has the opportunity to do so, we respectfully request one person per entity and two minutes per person. The order of public comment will be in-person comments, Zoom and phone comments, and emailed comments submitted prior to the meeting. For in-person comments, please form a line to, at the podium. For Zoom, please use the raise hand feature in the lower toolbar. For phone, please press star nine to raise your hand. Emailed comments received, received prior to the meeting will be read at the end. We will start uh, with the first person in line at the podium. Uh, good morning. My name is Patrick Besick. I'm the director of Oakland Undivided. Here to uplift the voices of historically red line communities, predominantly black and brown folks, who have been bypassed by public and private investment for decades. It is in these very communities, urban BIPOC communities, where nearly three quarters of disconnected Californians live. Two years ago, when Oakland was named one of the three urban communities selected for the initial middle mile investment, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was one of the best days of my life. For weeks, we had mobilized the entire community to participate in the process, and it had worked. I remember picking up the phone and the first call I made was to a community elder, a, mem a member of the NAACP and mentor to celebrate. In exuberance, I shared with him the news and in a very even voice, he responded to me, what makes you think that this time will be different? I wish the optimization map had been made public before the hearing, but hearing assembly member would say that poor communities are now relegated to the unfunded phase two I can again hear the community elders voice in my ear. What makes you think that this time will be different? I have no issue with the state taking a focus on the maximum coverage of unserved households. I stand alongside my tribal brothers and sisters and rural communities that have been bypassed by public investment and I understand that priority. But to use this for both middle mile and last mile, we have to assume that the state can accurately identify these locations. And I can tell you for a fact that these FFA maps, these the interactive California broadband map is fiction. Please don't take my word for it. Please Google interactive California broadband map, FFA last mile map, and then just zoom into the wealthiest community in your area. What you will see are dense clusters of unserved locations and you can demonstrably just go on Comcast website, type in the address, you'll see that they have, they have service. Then go over to the historically redline urban communities and you'll see just a peppering potentially of unserved locations, virtually ineligible for funding. It's true across California. Look at Presidio, look at Malibu, mansions that are unserved. Go to the Tenderloin, East Oakland, Boyle Heights, time and again. So I strongly recommend that the state do an analysis of the median income 
um, alongside phase one middle mile segments and phase two that's unfunded to see which communities were most impacted by this phased approach. I have a lot of trust in my partners at the state, and so I hope that we keep our promises to the families of East and West Oakland. So assuming that that's met, I think the most important topic and pivot uh, and focus area should be on differential rates. We met with an ISP earlier this week, and they got some preliminary insight into the cost of the network. And they were surprised at how expensive it was going to be to tap into the network and shared with us that as a low revenue density community, if the cost of backhaul is too high, they can't build out in our community. Market rate was named today. Market rate isn't working. Market rate hasn't worked for tens of thousands urban unconnected. So I implore that the cost matrix incentivizes build out of modern telecommunications infrastructure in these low revenue, low revenue density communities. To close, I wanna leave you with the same question that the elder, elder left with me two years ago. What makes you think that this time will be different? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment in the boardroom? I see none. I will go ahead and shift to my remote team. Are there uh, hands raised? And I'm gonna leave it up to Ms. Alvarado to call on them. Yes, I will call on Dr. Larry Orzaran. Please unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for holding this public hearing. Um, I'm Dr. Larry Ezrin with Clinical Informatics, a health technology consultancy. My focus is ensuring all Californians have equal access to health services. So I appreciate the comments and questions from assembly members Berner and Wood. My questions are in a similar vein. It sounds to me like the state is working effectively to make the most of these broadband funds and I applaud the work to date. However, I have concerns about how we're ensuring broadband access for every Californian at an affordable price when this project is completed and service providers start selling access. In regards to pricing, there's a lot of room below market rate that would still be unaffordable as the last commenter mentioned. I was wondering at what point will you get to a target? Is, is a target in user pricing $10 a month that everyone can, can afford or is it some number higher than that? And in terms of universal access, we're currently at risk, again, as the previous speaker mentioned, that private companies will cherry pick only the most profitable broadband endpoints. To the points made earlier by Mr. Monroe, Assembly Member Berner, and Secretary Tong, these efforts are all connected. The middle mile process is the leverage the state has for the last mile process. And I didn't hear any detail about how the middle mile, last mile linkage Mr. Monroe mentioned would work. If we want to ensure statewide coverage, how are we ensuring during the contracting process for access to middle mile infrastructure, that all of the parties will ensure access to all homes and businesses in the state? Um, are you looking at assigning percentages of homes served to amount of bandwidth access? Are you considering planning a lottery for assigning which last mile segments these entities must serve? As the previous speaker mentioned, if we don't um, include a requirement that these communities be served, there is a high probability that they won't be served. So, Ultimately, we have to get to the point of what is your plan to ensure that we take advantage of the middle mile process to eliminate the risk of dark last mile fiber and actually get broadband for all. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to Jeff Below. Please unmute. Morning, you can hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. My name is Jeff Below. I'm in the Department of Education. Um, great to hear um, about the update. I know our schools in K-12 are eagerly waiting for the middle mile to be built out so they can um, connect our last few schools that are still um, yet to have high speed. And of course, as others mentioned, looking forward to um, the connection out into the communities so you know kids can do their learning as well as families do everything else they need to do also. So again, appreciate the update and thank you for your time today. Thank you. We will now go to Emily Cohen. Please unmute. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thanks. Um, good afternoon, my name is Emily Cohen. I'm the Executive Vice President of United Contractors. We represent California's uh, union signatory contractors across the state uh, of all sizes and scopes. I just uh, wanted to weigh in today on Mr. Monroe's 
um, presentation and express our serious concerns with the recent redistribution of state government contracts for work related to this historic investment in broadband infrastructure. Um, following what seemed to be a great partnership between the state and the industry to uh, expeditiously install this much needed infrastructure, CDT has now changed course to a direction that really negatively impacts the union construction industry. And we are concerned that the changes being made by CDT to the procurement process uh, result in thousands of union jobs being lost, months of continued project delivery delays and significant financial harm to our union signatory uh, California construction contractors who were awarded these projects and in good faith have invested in new equipment, materials and planning to ensure that they could perform the work to the state's expectations. <clears throat> um, our construction firms were asked to submit uh, bids for this work through, through uh, Caltrans. They were awarded this work through JOX or CMGC. <clears throat> and to date, no work has begun. In some cases, the first work orders for JOX are now delayed uh, until September 30th, six months into their 12 month master service agreements. And while JOX are not guaranteed work, these contractors have collectively spent millions of dollars and hundreds of hours preparing bids and hiring up in preparation to perform this work. And they've given up hundreds of millions of dollars in additional work opportunities in California in anticipation of performing this work. We are concerned that CDT um, is preparing to redirect significant portions of this work to out-of-state non-union contractors, which would result in about 8 million union man hours being lost each year, which is thousands of union jobs. Um, and we, you know, no information has been shared with the contractors who are left sitting and waiting. And it's unclear if CDT plans to hold any newly awarded companies to the same public work standards, including prevailing wage. I, I know that uh, Mr. Monroe said that there would be prevailing wage, but it's very unclear what that rate would be if they would have apprenticeship standards. Uh, and follow state and federal DBE requirements, <clears throat> or if these companies plan to self-perform any of the work and so on. Uh, in addition to the JOC awarded projects, approximately 2,300 miles has been awarded through CMGC contracts. And many of those projects are delayed as much as six months. So we really believe that it's in the best interest of CDT and Caltrans in the state of California to begin work on this as soon as possible. You have until the end of 2026 to accomplish the goal of delivering the project and fully utilizing these funds. It is our goal and the goal of our union partners to partner with the state to deliver this important project to the people uh, to the people of California as effectively you, and efficiently as possible. Your time has expired. Moving to Sarah McCormick. Please unmute. Hello, thank you. And th thank you to the chair and members of this advisory committee. I also wanted to thank all of the dedicated staff from the various entities that presented. Um, I'm calling in from the city of Fort Bragg on the Mendocino coast. Uh, we are considered a rural socioeconomic disadvantaged community and do have some underserved, but most of our challenges is reliability and those that aren't connected because of affordability issues. Um, in response, we are really taking that challenge on and with the LATA funds are de developing a municipal utility to deploy bond broadband to our community at an affordable rate. And I wasn't able to see on the map if the middle mile um, is in, if our section of California State One is included in the first phase. Um, but I just wanted to call in anyway, just to kind of put on the record um, that we are willing to partner to bring Middle Mile here. We have only a single internet backhaul that's provided by AT&T, and AT&T is the, the only provider at this time. Um, some months ago, we had road construction going on, and 
somebody had cut through that backhaul connection and our schools were out, our hospital was out. And it was, it's just ridiculous at this point, we have to close down our schools because we don't have connectivity. <laughs> so I just kind of wanted to do a shout out from the rural community and also thank everybody because this is crazy complicated. And I know you're juggling a lot of different considerations. So thank you. That concludes our uh, Zoom uh, and phone calls. Next, we'll move to the emailed public comment. We received one prior to the um, meeting. It is from Ross Millerick. Question, when will fiber cable in Novato be installed and ready to use? That concludes our comments. Two more. Okay. Coming back to, we have additional comments in. This is Amy Hamblin. Please unmute. Can you hear me? This is yes. Amy. Thank you. This is Amy Hamblin with NextGen Policy and calling in to both applaud uh, CDT and all the other state agencies and local and regional partners that were involved in the monumental effort um, to ensure that the public and especially underserved communities were part of the process um, of figuring out how to actually put together a state digital equity plan, what that what that looks like, what in fact digital equity is. So wanted to really give a tip our hat to everyone involved in that effort. And then also I wanted to call attention to the fact that the current requirements um, currently disadvantage big ISPs in process and just wanted to bring some awareness to that and, and express our concern about that. And just to really encourage the CPUC to do uh, whatever they can to support smaller ISPs in that process. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to Ernie Pacheco. Please mm -hmm. unmute. Sure. Hello, uh, Ernie Pacheco, Communication Workers of America. Um, I'm the uh, broadband lead for for uh, District 9, uh, which is California, Nevada, and Hawaii. Um, I'm actually in the field and tools today with a really spotty service. So I've been hearing about every four out of every five words everyone's been saying today. Um, I did want to uh, speak up. And first of all, say thank you to Mark and to Scott and the others working on this. It's amazing how far we've come. Um, this is a, a, an immense project. Um, and it's looking like we actually may be able to pull this off. Uh, one of the statements, though, concerning labor goals, I want to echo a previous commenter, is from CWA's position. Um, while, there, yes, there is prevailing wage, we do not believe that as currently drafted, um, there is equity for workers in the actual building of this network. Um, there's a lot of different kind of workers. There are there are people that will be digging ditches, laying conduit, whatnot. But speaking solely for CWA, our members who place the fiber, rack the fiber, case the spi fiber, splice the fiber, repair, um, uh, maintain and operate the networks. This is this is historically our jobs. We don't feel that the current language um, captures equity for the workers. But we are engaged with with CDT um, and Caltrans in discussions on this. We look forward to uh, continuing that conversation. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Director, that concludes our comments. Thank you very much. Um, and just a comment on uh, the, the, uh, the we do at CDT and Caltrans are looking forward to the labor discussions that we are gonna have here in the next few weeks. And so with that, I would like to open it up to the members here. If there's any comments, closing statements. I don't see any here. Um, oh, Mr. McKeever. I just wanna express my appreciation for everybody working on this. This is a lot of work. It's really hard work, but uh, for a lot of benefit. Anyhow, thank you for, to everybody. Thank you, Mr. McKeever. All right, is there any comment um, from any members remotely? All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, this concludes our uh, Middle Mile Advisory Committee today. 
Uh, we heard a lot from our presenters and from the public, which uh, we really appreciate. And our next meeting is Friday, October 20th, 2023, from 10 to 1130. With that, we will adjourn today's meeting. Thank you.